Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing, or at least making the start of my quick review of the stories of F. Scott Fitzgerald, Volume 1, The Diamond as Big as the Ritz, and other stories. So, um, I'm going to read you the blurb here, and then I'm going to, I'll let you know which stories are in the collection, and then I'll go through and start looking at some of my tabs. There was a rough stone age, and a smooth stone age, and a bronze age, and many years afterward a cut glass age. In the cut glass age, when young ladies had persuaded young men with long curly moustaches to marry them, they sat down several months afterward and wrote thank you notes for all sorts of cut glass presents. The cut glass age, that, that bit there by the way is, is, the, is uh, the opening line of the first story in this collection. The cut glass age was Scott Fitzgerald's age and it splintered and shattered before his eyes. In these seven stories, the first volume in a new uniform penguin edition, Fitzgerald's insight reflects and refracts the profane image of America in the jazz age, creating cameos of a fairy tale life among the very rich. But the idols prove illusory and the picture is always disrupted by sharp, painful shafts of reality. So the stories in this collection, I'll give you the publication years as well. So we have the Cut Glass Bowl, 1920, May Day, 1920, the Diamond as Big as the Ritz, 1922, the Rich Boy, 1926, Crazy Sunday, 1932, An Alcoholic Case, 1937, and The Lees of Happiness, 1920. I wonder why they didn't, I guess it's probably not a very strong story, so they didn't want to put that last one towards the start, I don't know because otherwise it would be in chronological order, wouldn't it? So I thought I'd read out that full introduction, actually. Um, so sorry, because I've already read it. But <laughs> There was a rough stone age and a smooth stone age and a bronze age, and many years afterward, a cut glass age. In the cut glass age, when young ladies had persuaded young men with long curly moustaches to marry them, they sat down several months afterward and wrote thank you notes for all sorts of cut glass presents. Punch bowls, finger bowls, dinner glasses, wine glasses, ice cream dishes, bonbon dishes, decanters and cases, for, though cut glass was nothing new in the 90s, it was then especially busy reflecting the dazzling light of fashion from the back bay to the fastnesses of the Middle West. After the wedding, the punch bowls were arranged on the sideboard with the big bowl in the centre. The glasses were set up in the china closet. The candlesticks were put at both ends of things. And then the struggle for existence began. The bonbon dish lost its little handle and became a pin tray upstairs. A promenading cat knocked the little bowl off the sideboard. And the hired girl chipped the middle-sized one with the sugar dish. Then the wine glasses succumbed to leg fractures, and even the dinner glasses disappeared one by one like the ten little... can't say it, it's the name of the Agatha Christie novel though. The last one ending up scarred and maimed as a toothbrush holder among other shabby genteels on the bathroom shelf. But by the time all this had happened, the cut glass age was over anyway. It was well past its first glory on the day the curious Mrs. Roger Fairbolt came to see the beautiful Mrs. Harold Piper. I just think that's a great little introduction there. And the fact that he mentioned... So it's called 10 Little N-Words. It was the original title for And Then There Were None by Agatha Christie. Okay, that's cool, because I was just sitting there wondering about the publication years, because I was like, how can he be referencing Agatha Christie? This is 1920, and the Agatha Christie book came out in 1939, so he's not he's not reflecting the Agatha Christie book. It's the, it's the rhyme, the traditional rhyme or whatever, that Agatha Christie used within the book. This is a very sort of Scott Fitzgerald thing to write, but also I'm curious about it today, but he's, uh, one of the characters, Rose, he knew a waiter once. There ensued a long conversation as they walked as to whether waiters made more in actual wages than in tips. And it was decided that it depended on the social tone of the joint wherein the waiter laboured. I mean, we don't really do tips as much in the UK. So, well, like there was the phrase, um, somebody said that people were getting lit. So it's interesting that that's kind of gone out of fashion and then come back into fashion, you know? We have this girl here, she says, uh, she'd been kissed once and made love to six times. Um, you should clarify that Fitzgerald uses made love in a different way, so he doesn't mean had sex with. And then I quite like the end of this story, um, so spoiler alert, I'm just going to read the last paragraph or two here. Um, in fact, let's do the last scene, because it's not too long. In a bedroom of a small hotel just off 6th Avenue, Gordon Sterrett awoke with a pain in the back of his head and a sick throbbing in all his veins. He looked at the dusky grey shadows in the corners of the room and at a raw place on a large leather chair in the corner where it had long been in use. He saw clothes, dishevelled, rumpled clothes on the floor, and he smelt stale cigarette smoke and stale liquor. The windows were tight shut. Outside, the bright sunlight had thrown a dust-filled beam across the sill, a beam broken by the head of the wide wooden bed in which he had slept. He lay very quiet, comatose, drugged, his eyes wide, his mind clicking wildly like an unoiled machine. It must have been 30 seconds after he perceived the sunbeam with the dust on it and the rip on the large leather chair that he had the sense of life close behind him, and it was another 30 seconds after that before he realised he was irrevocably married to Jewel Hudson. He went out half an hour later and bought a revolver at a sporting goods store. Then he took a taxi to the room where he'd been living on East 27th Street and, 
leaning across the tables that held his drawing materials, fired a cartridge into his head just behind the temple. Bleak. So that was uh, May Day there. I'm going to move on to the diamond as big as the Ritz, but uh, I actually haven't started reading that one yet, so I'll be back to you soon. Character here says that last night she was sick with lettuce poisoning. Is that a, is that a thing? Oh yeah, and these um, people, they basically, because this is set in 1920 as well, they've deliberately found some black people who don't realise that slavery is over. And uh, someone goes here, because um, suddenly the whole portico of the Negro quarters cracked asunder. A geezer of flames shot up from under the colonnades and great fragments of jagged marble were hurled as far as the borders of the lake. There go $50,000 worth of slaves, cried Kismin at pre-war prices. So few Americans have any respect for property. Uh, they pretend to respect people more these days, mate. And I quite like this little um, bit of conversation here because I sometimes get freaked out by the stars as well. It's like the cosmicness of them. What a dream it was, Kismin sighed, gazing up at the stars. How strange it seems to be here with one dress and a penniless fiancé. Under the stars, she repeated. I never noticed the stars before. I always thought of them as great big diamonds that belonged to someone. Now they frighten me. They make me feel that it was all a dream, all my youth. It was a dream, said John quietly. Everybody's youth is a dream, a form of chemical madness. So we're going to move on to the rich boy, which is sort of very much investigating um, privilege. This character here, the rich boy, it says, At 28 he began to accept with equanimity the prospect of marrying without romantic love. He resolutely chose a New York girl of his own class, pretty, intelligent, genial, above reproach, and set about falling in love with her. I think if you've ever, I don't know, been single at an age older than about <laughs> 24 or something, you appreciate that. You have to train yourself to fall in love with people these days. Or you do fall in love with someone and they break your fucking heart, so... Bet, best train yourself, like, and you feel less disappointed when it's all over. Okay, then we have Crazy Sunday, in which um, Fitzgerald uses the N-word with ish on the end to describe someone's feet. He's basically saying they have feet like a black person, I suppose. Pretty disturbing, but I suppose, I mean, that was May Day, so when was that written? Was that when it was? I was written in 1920, so I guess you have to be more forgiven, but hey, it doesn't make it right, does it? So yeah, overall, I did enjoy The Diamond as Big as the Ritz by F. Scott Fitzgerald, and I will be reading some more of his short story collections. Overall, I would give it a pretty solid four out of five and would recommend it. So there we have it. That's what I made of The Diamond as Big as the Ritz by F. Scott Fitzgerald. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments if you've read this book and if so, what you thought of it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit subscribe for more, and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.